So I'm pleased to introduce Pamela Druckerman to Politics and Prose at the Wharf this evening. Druckerman is a contributing writer at the New York, opinion writer at the New York Times, and the author of four books, including the international bestseller, Bringing Up Baby, One American Mother Discovers the Wisdom of French Parroting, which has been translated into 27 languages. In her new books, There Are No Grown-Ups, Druckerman investigates what it means to be 40 and considered middle-aged, even when 40 is not technically middle-aged anymore. Part memoir and part investigation of daily life, There Are No Grown-Ups diagnoses perils and pluses of reaching this in-between decade and reveals that everyone is winging it when it comes to adulthood, some just more successfully than others. Ariel Levy, author of The Rules Do Not Apply, writes, Druckerman brings her irresistible combination of wit, humility, humility, curiosity, and insight to topics as grown up as facing mortality and planning a threesome. Her new book is sure to delight anyone undergoing, contemplating, or recovering from middle age. There Are No Grown Ups is a sparkling meditation on what it means to come of age as a modern human being. Now please join me in welcoming Pamela Druckerman. Hi. Hi. Seeing some old friends. Can you, can you, I think it needs to be a little more, yeah. Um, I'll just get into it. So, so I used to think of myself as a serious journalist. Um, I was a foreign correspondent for a major newspaper. I got a degree in international relations. I read The Economist. I did push-ups. And eventually, as the pinnacle of all this, I managed to get a column in another newspaper where I pegged my reports, my monthly columns, to important news events. I did lots of serious research and interviews. I was prepared to be fact-checked. And then one month for my column, my own birthday was approaching. And I thought, well, what if this month I just pegged the column to my birthday? And instead of reporting and interviewing people, I just made a list of everything I knew at that moment. The things I thought about all the time but never really used in my work, the things that preoccupied me, aging. <laughs> and then I thought, no, you're not allowed to do that. And, uh, I, and then I thought, and even worse, if I do it, everyone will know how old I am. <laughs> but I steeled myself and I did it. I wrote that column. It was called, What You Know in Your 40s. And I remember I was fact-checked on this column, even though it had all just kind of come out of my imagination, by a fact-checker at the New York Times who said, because I had said, in your 40s you realize that you're 95% like other people and 5% unique, just 5% of you is different. And I meant that kind of spiritually, personality-wise, and the fact-checker wanted to know, did I have sourcing for this? Could I prove it? And so I had to insert a line that said, in my opinion, <laughs> we're only 5% unique. And this column, pegged to my birthday and revealing my age, was the most widely read article I'd ever written, which I can't say was saying that much at that point, but still, it, uh, it kind of caught fire. And I had taken this risk and put myself out there and basically just emptied my brain and my id onto the page and exposed myself. And it worked. It resonated with, res resonated with people. I got, I probably got hundreds of letters from different people saying that they felt similarly to the way I felt. It turned out I was right. I was 95% like other people. And I felt validated, not just as a writer, but as a human being. I think that's actually when I started calling myself a writer and not a journalist. So literally about a week after that column ran, I had a book contract. <laughs> It had all happened so fast to write a book based on the column. It had happened so fast, I had barely digested it. I did, I have to say, consult a psychic at one point before I signed the book contract. And I said, do you see me writing this book? And she said, oh yeah, I see this book just flowing out of you. And I was like, okay, I'll sign, I'm ready. And uh, so now I had this book contract to turn my 1,000 word column into a 65,000 word book with wisdom on being in your 40s. There was just one teeny tiny issue, which was I really wasn't sure whether I had 64,000 more words of wisdom to add to this subject. Um, spoiler alert, it, I did, <laughs> it's in here, I promise. But 
getting from point A to point X or Z was one of the hardest things I've ever done um, as a writer or a human being. Um, the column had been basically just a list of bullet points. Uh, one of them was, when you meet someone extremely charming in your 40s, you know that you should be cautious instead of dazzled because by your 40s, you've gotten better at spotting narcissists before they ruin your life. You know that nice isn't a sufficient quality for friendship, but it's a necessary one. So I like that, but the book isn't a list of things like that. It has to be a story. Uh, it needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. What was gonna be the story of my book? What were these 65,000 words gonna say? Um, for a while, when I first started working on the book, I refused to read the 40s column that the book was supposedly based on. It terrified me. When I looked at it, it seemed, in retrospect, like this perfectly formed, petite little creature, and anything I added to it would make it worse. And then even worse, people would come up to me and say, oh, I love that 40s column you wrote. I would just become more and more depressed. So I, I basically just fell back on my roots as a reporter at that point. I started researching the 40s in a very serious, hard-nosed, journalistic way. Um, I researched the history of the age, what the 40s are like in different countries, I interviewed a woman from Afghanistan about the 40s there and a woman in Pakistan about her 40s. The neuroscience of the 40s, all the psychological research that's been done about the 40s, every, and then I got into the 50s a little bit. I did midlife more generally. I read every study, every report. I decided I would report this book to pieces. And I spent months kind of delving into all this research and then trying to summarize it masterfully in these kind of definitive chapters about what this decade and what this era in life is. There was just one tiny problem with all of this, which is that what I was writing was unbelievably dull. <laughs> it bored me just to read it myself. My column had been light and playful and funny, and this research was heavy and obligatory. And I fell into what some of you here might recognize as a book depression. Any writer knows what this is. You cannot make any progress on the book you're working on, but because the book is hanging over you, you cannot allow yourself to do anything other than the book either. You are stalled as a human being. The book was definitely not flowing out of me as had been promised. Um, it's true that every once in a while, something funny would happen to me in real life, something that had to do with my 40s, and I would quickly scribble it down in a notebook, which I carried with me everywhere. But then I'd go back to my depressing pile of research. I did one outline filled with chapters I didn't really want to write, and then another outline filled with more chapters I didn't really want to write. It was like a bad book report. I was getting nowhere, and my husband was starting to panic. At the same time, I was reading Elena Ferrante, the Neapolitan novels. Has everybody, I hope everybody has read them in the audience. Raise your hand if you have not read Elena Ferrante. Yeah. Okay, you have to. <laughs> um, the main character in the book is a writer who has a book due, and uh, she's getting nowhere. And finally, the night before the final drop dead, uh, we're gonna demand our money back deadline for the book, she has nothing. And she remembers, oh my gosh, there was that manuscript of a novel that I wrote years ago, and it's on a shelf somewhere, and she pulls it off the shelf out of desperation, and she sends that to her publisher instead. And of course, the manuscript, which she had thought was terrible, was brilliant, her publisher loves it, and she's rescued by this book that she didn't have to write. And even though she's just a literary character, I was so jealous when I read that. I thought, oh, if only I had a manuscript in a drawer that I could pull out, but I, I, I didn't have a spare manuscript. All I had was this column, this 40s column, that I couldn't even bear to look at. So finally, in desperation, I forced myself to read it again. And I started to read it again and again and again, over and over. And I realized that, oh my God, the column is an outline for the book. And all my bullet points in the column are kind of chapter headings of the themes I need to cover in the book. So while I didn't have a manuscript, I also realized that those funny stories that I'd been jotting down on the side as a kind of like guilty pleasure when I wasn't really working on the book, those were the book. And all those mountains of research, that was just gonna be little extras that I sprinkled through the manuscript. A couple of years had passed at this point. I was in my mid 40s by then, and I also realized my 40s, the things that had happened to me while I was trying to write the book, these were part of the book too. The, the narrative of the book was gonna be the story of my own 40s. 
Um, there were still several more years of work to do after that revelation, and unfortunately was not like in the Ferrante novel. But once I gave up my view of what I thought the book was supposed to be, and just went with the fun and the pleasure and the stories that really genuinely were flowing out of me, and telling the true story of what happened, the book really began to take shape. I trusted the material. I trusted once again that I really was 95% like other people and that my deepest thoughts and fears were probably theirs too. This book began to flower and to take shape and to get off the page. One of my conclusions in the book is that in your 40s, you understand other people better, finally. <laughs> what I actually say is that the 40s are a journey from everyone hates me to they don't really care. <laughs> but you do, in the 40s, see the world more clearly. You can read people better. In that mountain of uh, research, one study I found, which was really interesting, was a, a, a test uh, called Reading the Mind in the Eyes. It was initially used to diagnose whether people had autism or not. And you basically look at a rectangular shaped photograph of somebody's eyes and you have to judge or guess what that person is feeling, which emotion that person is feeling. And people in their 50s and their 40s scored the highest of any age group on this test. Um, the Buddhists say that becoming aware of what's happening around you is the whole point of being a person and the truest source, the, the really the only source of lasting, enduring happiness. You can feel brief pleasure without being able to do that but enduring pleasure comes from understanding what's going on. And I have to say that for me, that is the biggest source of happiness in the 40s. The fact that other minds are less opaque, the fact that you can have shared experiences in a way that I think for me and a lot of people was very challenging before. Another study I read, and I won't get lost in the weeds of the studies, shows that people on average, and this is around the world, except for some reason in Germany, um, which if there are any Germans in the audience, perhaps they can, can venture a theory on this, are less neurotic in their 40s than they used to be before. Neuroticism declines. And that's hugely important because what neuroticism is, is this kind of self-conscious chatter in your brain saying, what, you know, thinking about yourself. What do they think of me? What am I doing? And once that quiets down, you kind of open the channel to take in a lot more information about other people. You can finally kind of listen well and enjoy people's company in a way that they can enjoy too. And this makes it easier to be around people in their 40s. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to your high school reunions, but the ones I went to in my 20s and 30s were um, kind of competitive. People were checking each other out. They were worried about what their status was. By the one that you go to in your 40s, people just want to have a good time, enjoy each other's company. And I think that's a, a, a good kind of story of what the 40s can be. Another theme that comes out of this book is that in the 40s, you become who you are, if all goes well. That is the mission of the 40s. And uh, you put aside the things that you thought you were supposed to be, the stories you were telling yourself about who you are and what you're good at. And you look hard at yourself and it's kind of this now or never moment where you say, I'm gonna focus on what I really am, what I really am good at. Um, and that was kind of the journey for me of this book and it's the journey of the 40s. Um, I thought I would end by tonally changing completely from the making of the book and read one of the stories about what happened to me in my 40s or actually on the cusp of my 40s when I was 39. Um, and about to turn 40. Uh, I apologize to the people who have brought their parents to this event tonight. <laughs> um, but when my, uh, you can cover your ears if you have to. Um, when my husband was, my husband's a few months older than me and he was turning 40 before I did. And I said, well, I, I told him I was thinking of getting him like a, a, good, a nice watch for his 40th birthday. I thought, you know, he dresses in kind of tattered clothes and if you had the right watch, it could just anchor him as a, as a grown up. And he said, um, you know what, I really, I, I don't want to watch. He said, what I, what I want is that thing that I've been mentioning to you like over the years, every once in a while, which is, um, I, I, I feel like I can't even look at you when I say this. He, he wanted a threesome with me and another woman. And so I'll just read a little bit to you about what happened next. 
Um, his name is Simon, and he's not listening. <laughs> uh, Simon's request is spontaneous, but serious. And just as spontaneously, I say yes. As a journalist, I have trouble resisting a deadline. He'll turn 40 in about six weeks. I also like the idea of a gesture to show that I'm not slipping quietly into middle age. And frankly, I'm procrastinating. I need a distraction from the parenting book that I've been struggling to finish but can't figure out how to write. We agree on the threesome in principle, but the idea is so exotic that for a few weeks it just sits there. Occasionally I mention the name of a female friend. Would she be acceptable, I ask Simon? Absolutely, he says each time. <laughs> it turns out that practically every woman we know all my female friends and the wives of practically all his male friends would potentially make the cut, including the pregnant ones. Simon doesn't want to spoil his chances by being picky. This hardly matters because at first I'm too embarrassed to raise the topic with anyone we know. And though I'm a novice at this, I'm pretty sure that recruiting a friend would be a mistake. There's the enormous potential for awkwardness on the day itself and long afterward. And I don't want someone creating a wedge in our cozy twosome. I'm envisioning this as a one-off. Anyway, I wouldn't know which girlfriend to ask. Straight women don't often discuss their same-sex fantasies with each other. I'm not sure who'd be tempted by the idea and who'd be appalled. Finally, over brunch, we summon the courage to discuss our plans with friends of Simon's who are visiting from London. My husband's British. One of them, a single British banker who's nearing 40 herself, grimaces and then goes silent. You look horrified, I say. Yes, I mean, I think it's just extraordinary, she says, blushing. Soon after the brunch, I get an email from an editor I know at a women's magazine in New York. She's short on first-person essays and wonders whether I have any ideas. As a freelancer, I'm not really used to being asked to write anything. I quickly send her three story ideas, one on making friends in Paris, another on the travails of renovating my kitchen, and a third on planning a threesome for my husband's birthday. I honestly don't realize that there's an obvious front runner. <laughs> she replies almost immediately and wants to know details about the threesome, including whether I've already found the other woman. Soon, I have a contract obliging me to deliver a 2,800 word essay titled 40th Birthday Threesome. <laughs> to be fair, I was planning to have the threesome anyway, but after I signed the document, I realized that I'm now more or less contractually obliged to go through with it. I'll be paid by the word, and a sexless version in which I back down would probably get less space. More critical than whether I might have sex for money is whether I'll have sex at all. I've realized that women aren't falling over themselves to sleep with a soon-to-be middle-aged married couple. Simon and I rule out advertising online, since that seems like an open call for venereal disease. We decide that the ideal third party would be a sexy acquaintance. She'd be vetted, everyone knows acquaintances don't have herpes, but easy enough to avoid afterward. A candidate soon emerges. She's an American friend of a friend whom I've met a few times at dinner parties. By chance, she's seated behind us at a concert with a man who appears to be her date. For the first time, I notice that she's quite attractive. She's tall and thin with a little ballerina's waist, and I'm pretty sure she's sassy. How about her, I whisper to my husband as the music starts. Yes, he says too loudly. <laughs> After the concert, the four of us chat. I make firm eye contact with the woman, work out that her name is Emma, and pretend to be fascinated by her views on the performance. When I suggest that she and I have lunch, she seems flattered. A few days later, I get gussied up to meet her for Thai food. I'm pleased to see when I arrive that she has dressed up too. Does she realize that she's on a date? I'm usually so concerned about what other people think of me that my lunch companion could be bleeding to death and I wouldn't notice. But the threesome planning has made me more attentive. Over soup, I listen carefully to Emma and quickly understand something that would have once taken me years to realize. Under a pond of sassiness is a lagoon of insecurity. The common theme of her stories is that she clings to boyfriends who mistreat her. I'd mistaken tall for self-possessed. She's probably too emotionally fragile for a threesome, but I broached the topic anyway to get some practice. I do this under the guise of exchanging girly confidences, saying, you won't believe what my husband wants for his birthday. I explain that I've agreed to this in principle, but that I haven't yet found the third party. 
I think she understands that I'm propositioning her, but instead of taking the bait, she morphs into the Cassandra of threesomes. She describes the ex-boyfriend who pressured her to go to bed with him and his other lover, and the couple who swapped partners for the night, then never swapped back. She warns me that I'll be scarred by images of my husband doing unspeakable things to another woman. And what if it's someone who's incredibly hot, she asks. How could you possibly handle that? Not only is Emma out of the running, she talks of future lunch dates at other Asian restaurants. <laughs> to my horror, she seems to want to become my friend. I'm suddenly sympathetic to those male friends of mine who disappeared the moment I got engaged to Simon. Why stick around? That night, I tell Simon about my date, which cost me 50 euros and consumed half of my work day. Thanks for taking care of that, he says, without looking up from his computer. It's exactly what he says when I've waited at home all morning for the plumber to arrive, or I've replaced the rechargeable batteries in our phones. Planning the threesome has become another one of my administrative tasks. Nevertheless, my new man's eye view of the world is thrilling. I now notice women everywhere, browsing in bookstores, in line at the supermarket. I even scan my book group, middle-aged expatriates who like to read about the Holocaust for candidates. <laughs> and though I've only managed one failed seduction, my posture toward the world has changed. Instead of sitting pretty and hoping that others notice me, I feel like someone who decides what she wants and goes after it. I'm less interested in what others think of me and more focused on what I want from them. I can suddenly envision myself walking into a room and demanding a promotion. It's also energizing to put this once furtive fantasy on the table. Threesomes suddenly seem to be everywhere, although the message about them is paradoxical. Every straight man supposedly wants to have one, but no one has had a good one. A friend tells me that he bedded two women on the night of September 11th, 2001, as they all watched the news on television together. But like many threesome stories, his is a cautionary tale. One of the women developed a serious, unreciprocated crush on him. Inside every threesome is a twosome and a onesome, a character on a TV show warns. When I discuss the planning with my therapist, a Briton who works in Paris, he warns me that introducing a third party could damage my marriage. I'm undeterred, but still no closer to finding the other woman. When the magazine editor calls asking me for an update, I explain that Simon and I have extended the deadline a few weeks past his actual birthday. I decide to look at some websites. Perhaps not everyone on them has gonorrhea. I quickly see that we have competition. At least a dozen couples, all of them claiming to be gorgeous and under 30, are seeking women for a threesome too. Since I can't compete on looks or age, I decide to distinguish myself by sounding desperate. My post reads, I'd like to give my partner his best birthday present ever, an experience with me and another woman. Will you help me? <laughs> 15 minutes later, I get a reply that's literate and nice. Hi, I also have a boyfriend with the same fantasy. Not very original, I know, but boys will be boys. Maybe we could end up doing a deal, though not necessarily. If we like each other, I'd be happy to help out. What kind of scenario did you have in mind? She signs it, N. It's probably imprudent to pledge loyalty to an anonymous woman who scans no strings websites, but I decide on the spot that I won't respond to anyone else. I like her sisterly tone and her perfect spelling. I'm not sure about the exchange deal, but that doesn't seem to be mission critical for her. That when I read her message to Simon that night, he immediately says, I'll swap you. <laughs> We exchange several more emails. I call myself P. N, a Briton living in Paris, claims to be a straight, divorced, disease-free mom in her late 40s. She's relieved to hear that I have kids too. She says that she responded to my ad out of a kind of sexual altruism. And she quotes the French expression, one need not die an idiot. As I'm putting on a dress to go meet N for coffee, I'm suddenly struck by the strangeness of what I'm about to do try to convince a stranger to sleep with me and my husband? It's now real and I'm nervous. I've only ever been on the receiving end of seduction attempts. How exactly do I convince a woman to take off her clothes? Simon, who devoted years of his life to exactly this question, <laughs> gives me a little pep talk. With women, you have to listen to all the stuff they say. They have all these complex emotional issues and you have to try to figure out what they are. Just keep asking questions, be pleasant and reassuring, 
but also slightly mysterious. He's probably afraid that I'll back out because he adds that to keep life interesting, sometimes you have to stick your neck out. It's not my neck that's going to be sticking out, I say. Okay.